Thank you very much for uh, volunteering to do this interview for us. Uh, just on behalf of Parramatta Rugby, I'd like to uh, thank you for the last three years as coach with us and as you as you, you move on. And we'd like to keep this for posterity and uh, see uh, a little bit about your background and, and your, your future hopes and things for Parramatta. So I'll, the first question is, can you just tell us a little bit about uh, your playing career when you played in New Zealand and how you got into coaching? Yep, well... Playing in New Zealand is just it's just what we did. So um fell into the game at five years old, pretty much playing for my older brother's team that rolled on through there, played it through high school, made various group teams and provincial teams, etc. Um, went into the senior ranks and used the game basically as a as a social outlet. I you know, went around the world a bit with it and yeah, made the odd provincial team and so you're a back. I was back in the day originally when I started out. Um, say that. Yep, played at 12. It's my, it's my spot, but it was in the day when, um, you didn't have to have too much skill to play 12, to be honest. It was virtually an extra four. You know, if they wanted to do something flash in the backs, they just put the ball past me and I didn't get to touch it. If they needed something tough done, then I hit the ball up and the rats. So, um, yeah, played 12. I uh, did a stint in Scotland, loved it. Um, yeah, then I, then I had a break while I was in the military police in the Air Force because I was doing shift work, so I couldn't play the game for a bit of boxing and, um, went back to the game after that and fell into the back room, treating, you know, a little bit heavier and a little bit slower. Okay. So when did you take up the coaching? Um, yeah, straight after, not long after leaving did the Did you start in juniors or did you go straight into? Um, I was very, very fortunate. I fell straight into an assistant coach role with Northland. The nine things, which is a provincial side. Um, guy that used to coach me way back in, in my cup days, just played to the side. So, uh, yeah, I was very fortunate, probably in the back door at the time. Something that annoys all other coaches. So, and I'm here, pulled that off, so I was straight into sort of upper level provincial rugby. Okay. So, when, when you were coaching there, what, what was your philosophy? We've talked about it before with uh, um, uh, You've got a, a, a mild man about you now, but you were originally you were. Yeah, I look back, back in those days, I was, um, used to fire myself up quite a bit, and then in the endeavour to fire the boys up, used to, um, go into the change rooms after warm up and give a speech to the boys, pump my fists a bit and yell and scream and throw things. And yeah, I found when I left the change rooms that I was the most fired up with the whole group. And, <laughs> It didn't make any difference. Yeah, it wasn't until I talked to a couple of boys at the end of one season and they, with a great deal of humour, sort of expressed their thoughts on my pre-game ritual and you know, basically said they didn't listen to it and ignored it except for having a laugh about it. And so ever since that day, I've never never gone back into the change room before a game. I leave the boys to that, that part of it. So... Yeah, so having watched you in the change room, things like that, the, the, the players definitely respect you, so that, that carried across. Um, is that something you build up or something you've always had? Yeah, I think I, I got to a point where I just just threw all the textbooks out, I guess, and uh, just decided to be myself. You know, you come through the system, you go, I've done level four IRB coaching courses, and you know, you get, get all hung up on the textbook and what you should be doing when you should be doing it. And, you know, the, the old one negative, two positives, one negative when you speak right. and uh, all that side of it, you know. Yeah, and then I just threw that out and just be myself and if it's too negative for the boys and I need to do something better for next week, I guess. So, so when did you come to Australia then? When did that, how did that come about? Oh, seven years ago now. Um, I was coaching Northland Development Squad at the time, which is the level below ITM Cup and um, basically the second to thing. And um, through the guy I was coaching with, he knew someone in Queensland down by Canberra and they were looking for a coach and a couple of phone calls and emails back to some forwards and he yeah, decided to have a chat to the wife, the boss, and he yeah, decided we'd do two years in Australia, see how it went, and yeah, it's been seven years now. So we, yeah. that's your first time as a professional coach with me, with Queensland, yep. like Yep. Well, I was um, in New Zealand, I was working as a development manager, and coaching as well, so yeah, it's been, I think it's been 13 years now in professional writing, doing it as a full-time 
for fun gig. So yeah. I think uh, professional rugby <coughs> as it is is good for the game being played. Or yeah, um, I think the game as a whole is struggling to come to terms with it. I mean, trying to hold on to all those traditional values in the amateur days where guys did it for love and and were passionate about what they did. I think that's that's leaving the game and. That's just the way it's going to progress. But I think it's, it's trying to hold on to those values. And I think that'll, that'll change over the years. You only have to look at soccer and you know, American football, all those sports that have been doing it forever. And you know, there is no passion. Or, I mean, there's passion. Guys are obviously passionate when they take the field. But in terms of what drives them to get out there, there's a whole new set of motivators going on. Yeah. Now, when you're uh, with Queen Dan, you won the competition. Twice. Twice. <laughs> <laughs> How long did it take you to do that? Did you do it the first year? Or yeah, year one. Um, I just, yeah, I don't know quite what happened there, to be honest. They hadn't won it for 24 years. Um, yeah, we, we pulled it off in year one. We qualified third into the 14 final series and, and rolled on through. We had, a, we had a preliminary final, qualified for the grand final against Vikings, who were the power brokers down there, and we were down 28 mil at half time. And um, they still, um, we won 48, 43, 35 million. And it was always down there still talk about a great half time that I had. And to be honest, I was pretty much lost for ideas, so there's no, no need to yell and scream. Let's just go out there and play the next 40. And yeah, somehow we turned around and then we won the grand final comfortably. And from there, we were. Yeah, pretty dominant the following year. Okay. And then how did you light up the time out of that? I went to Vikings after Queenbian for two years. Um, and that was a set of interesting sort of circumstances in terms of where Queenbian were going. And we, we as a family have decided I wanted to stay in Australia for, for a bit and Vikings had the best opportunity to do that. So did the unthinkable in Canberra and go from any club to Vikings. And so, yeah, I was, I was a devil for a little while there in Queenie. Okay. And I'm here for two years in Vikings and different environment, but yeah, thoroughly enjoyed it. Okay. And then you were paid by Paramount to come down here? Yeah, through a couple of emails backwards and forth towards the end of my last second year at Vikings and um, a couple of emails towards, between Bally and myself. And um, yeah, so, yeah, I was exploring a couple of clubs and had a few options and yeah, Bally sort of did it his way and popped in a car one day and drove to Canberra to basically a half hour of coffee and that, that went down pretty well. So he did turn up an hour late. So that that's really interesting, but so what about the history of the club? Because yeah, we the previously came, you know, we we were, we were on our knees and and uh, yeah, a hundred and 11 nil against Man or something like that, we made all the papers, so there would have been a bit of a few stories for you to hear about the club and things like that. So, what I mean, that's, that's a big thing to, to, to walk into a club, into a, a losing club, and, and, and be prepared to try and change it around. Yeah, and that, that's probably what it feels. I did four years in Canberra, played every grand final, gone through them, lost the last one in the last minute. Um, I was just a little bit over that side of things, so I found myself. That and go what I loved about the game. I'm all about winning, winning premierships, and, and that's that's not how I was brought up or what I played or what I was in the game for. And um, the challenge really appealed. You know, I, I had the coffee with Belly and then did a bit of research about the club, and uh, 130 years of history was there, and pretty successful history. Way back yeah, then. obviously yeah. the recent history was horribly alarming. Um, but yeah, you do research about the area, the people, and there's obviously the club's got a whole lot of passion and pride in it. So yeah, I back myself to make a few changes. And so what would you? I'm, I'm, I'm not up on the stats, but I think 66 games before when you took over to coach the first grade had won a game in 66 games or something like that. It's an incredible number. Were you aware of those types of stats? Or? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can't remember what it was. I know it's been a couple of years or something. But, um, yeah, it's very aware of that. And um, actually, Dan Yakupo, who kind of played here, made me aware of 
everything else because we had a coffee and he back in Canberra and he said, yeah, yeah I'm looking at the Parramatta. He walked into my office the next day and said, bro, I've been looking at the scores online. And he was, he was a little bit shocked and alarmed. He sort of said, this thing's going to change. And I said, well, I'm hoping. <laughs> so, yeah, he made me aware of that. But, yeah, definitely aware of that. Yeah, the first one was. Yes, we'll bring it. I oh, grabbed Park, um, 22 17 from, from memory. Um, yeah, I think it was round four, so we had three losses. And That's not too bad. Yeah, no, considering the year before that we uh, think yeah. we had a draw. And the losses have been okay. We played Uni, Randwick, and Manly, I think it was. And yeah, went out to Rat Park. We were paying $11 or something through the TAB, but. Yeah, we, we were pretty confident that you were up 22 10, then they scored late. And I remember the game ending with a Andrew Cox turnover in the hard on defense. That was it. But I also, too, I mean, from that, when I talked about the bad days, from say 2010, there's only like um, seven or eight of them you still were in that side that won, yeah, which was really good. So you didn't change yeah. too many things. I think, I think they had good heart, things like that. Just, uh, yeah. yeah. It was important. To maintain that and keep that. Um, you, know, you look back to that year and that game in particular, like for me, it wasn't a big deal. I, you know, we were just playing and we were going to win eventually, but probably the reaction of the boys when the full time whistle went just looked sort of ground home to me what a big deal it was. And you, know, you have to be happy for the guys like Andrew Cox and, and that that have gone through those unlocks. You know, if, if anyone bleeds blue, it's, it's Coxie, you know, he's Parramatta through and through. And I think he's the most underrated player going around in the comp. He's, he's just sensational week in, week out. You know exactly what you're going to get. And <laughs> yeah. He should have been sort of gotten into those higher honours. I think at some stage he's, he's sensational. So that, that first year, what was your impression about your first year? And you, uh, you set the goals. So you said, I know you said goals and targets. So what was your, your first year's goal? Oh, it was club. just simply gaining a bit of respect around around the other clubs and in the competition. And, you know, I think we achieved that comfortably and yeah, exactly. pretty pretty quickly in that season. So, yeah, that was the whole the whole crux of that first year. I think we managed to pick up five wins in the end. Um, we had Southern Districts at, at their ground, which was, which, yeah, that was a great was a big yeah. result. So, yeah, it was, yeah, we just earned respect and... Um, Got a little bit of self confidence out of it and self belief. And then the second year, too, which was going to be last year, uh, having made the, uh, the finals and things like that, first time in 25 years, what was your, what was your feeling there? What was your goal for the, for the year, for the following year? Yeah, I've I never had targets of winning games, or it was just about the guys progressing as a team and individually. And, you know, we achieved that and last year, and we sort of we got on a bit of a bit of a role and, and we had the feel good factor going on. We were just turning up and playing week in, week out and it yeah, continued to upset the other teams and clubs and yeah, just rolled on through. Do you think the structure of the season last year was better? So we like the rep charge hit it or like this year where we just yeah. Yeah. I didn't I didn't like it. I could see why they were trying to do it. I think they would have been better off to go odds and evens. I don't think it ultimately had an impact on us making or not making the finals. Um, I think we would have either way. Um, but yeah, I think the perceptions out there that it helped us. And, but I think in terms of gaining respect, I think we, we took another level up to where we're now sort of serious contenders. What were your feelings about this, the first TV game that you had with the club? Yeah, it was, it was good in the week after our, our first one against Moringa. It's over there, and yeah, it was a good experience for the boys. But we had that um, TMO decision in there. It will um, certainly, certainly be remembered as possibly the worst that made TV in New Zealand on the rugby show. So, yeah, it's just an absolute screamer, to be honest. We had the um, official letter of apology from the referees, but it's, it's easy to write one of those. I just fail to understand how he can look at the same TV screen as the commentators and. You now you're sitting in between the two commentators who were both saying that he's out. But he wasn't just out, he's out. But yeah, you know, it's exclude, I think I was on the other side of the field, but I don't know, I'm, I'm biased. It was pretty much from the, from the waist down, like literally he was out. And 
Yeah, I was obviously sitting in the stand a long way from it, but my phone started going nuts with texts as soon as it happened. So, so I knew something had gone on. And with uh, last year, we named it the finals and things like that. What was your feeling going down? I know it manly um, got away with you and, and, and uh, you, could, you couldn't pull it back. Yeah, they did. We, the week before the first round of the finals, we played West Harbour here and um, we got through it, but. In terms of physicality, they absolutely bashed the hell out of us. We um, pretty much didn't have a fully fit back the following week. We were limited in what we could do at training. So um, yeah, we rolled over the Manly just and we knew you know, everything had to go well for us. We had to start well and we had to execute everything well. And we just we didn't quite start well and we just, the harder we tried, the further that we got away from pulling the lot, so yeah, it was, it was a learning experience, and um, yeah, we just probably more than anything needed to get through that West Harbour game in better shape than we did. We, we took them on at their game, which was a smash fest, and yeah, we lost Damien with a broken arm early on in that game. So it must have been a bit of satisfaction this year when you beat Man in the first round. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, certainly one of the better results over the last three years. Um, showed you know, what we can do as a team when we've got when we're firing on all cylinders and you know, it was probably a lot closer than the scoreline suggested and it was forty three seventeen or something in the end, but yeah, we defended down this end for was a lot of penalties. I can't remember. Yeah. Yep. Some like nine eight penalties against us in a row. Yep. And they just tackled that relatively standard. <laughs> That's what I've got a referee down to ask about that later on. What do you, what do you, we might have been that in. What do you think about the refereeing in, in Sydney football or in Australia? Yeah, look, it's a tough job and if you wouldn't have a game without them. So it goes the cliches. Um, frustrating though, I think there's a whole level of consistency missing. I think it's damaging to the game. You know, good or bad, it doesn't matter as long as they're consistent with it. You can adjust your game and adjust what you're doing at training and whatnot. But um, it's just too too inconsistent, and um, from week to week you're getting different interpretations, and it makes it really tough. I know, sort of move back to the players and, and things like that. To, you know, to have uh, to seeing an All Black turn up and play for you must have been pretty impressive too. And some of the players. Of coming up the street and, and, and just added to the club. Yeah, it was one of the better random walk-ins you can ever have. It was near the end of that season, and he just pretty much walked through the gates and signed a retro form. And the way he went, he um, had a few injuries at the time, and I sort of tried to put him into first grade the first week, and he, he wouldn't have a bar of it. He insisted on playing second grade the first weekend. He, he um, didn't want to just be seen as a bloke that walks in and pushes everyone aside and walks in the first grade. So he played second grade, he came on in first grade and he actually scored the winning try out there against Penrith. But um, he's a fantastic bloke and plays the game for the, for the right reasons. Oh, certainly. certainly so. He can stay, in the, stay, up, stay upright. Yeah. He's with the ball when he takes bumps yeah. and things like that too. He's just, just a quality player and he was getting back to his best pretty much this season. Took up the opportunity to go to Romania and play a bit of rugby and a bit of money. And from what I'm hearing from him and seeing from him on Facebook, he's just enjoying the nightlife over there. Yes, <laughs> it's good. He's a neat freak, too, so I don't know how he's getting up. He is, he is, you know, his socks have to be folded a certain way. If you, if you open his kit bag on game day, everything's folded and placed in a particular order. And, yeah. So, had you met him before? Uh, no, I hadn't actually. No, um, Jared Fasavalu, our assistant coach, had, had known him previously, and yeah, so he just rolled in, and it was like he'd always been there, fitted in well with the boys, and he's got a bit of leadership to him, so it's been good. So, what about this year then? I mean, I know it's your last year and things like that. And so, you said, what are your goals and this for this year and in future? Um, well, this season we, you know, we we had pretty high expectations early on. I think. Um, my playing group and club and supporters and whatnot, and I think that in itself is a learning curve for the club. Um, you know, we we got away from just playing week in and week out and playing for enjoyment. We sort of got ourselves bogged down a few times, worried about the, the scoreboards and the, the competition tables and whatnot. And 
you know, once again, you, you get yourself into a corner and you know the harder you work to try and fix things, so the, the, the worse it gets for you. We had some we had a horrific injury toll this year. We were down to our fourth and fifth string tight head props at times, had no second rows with injury. And, and that, that really hurt us, and that was sort of in a moment where we needed to get ourselves on a bit of a roll through the middle there. You know, but I thought the turning point might have been North Sydney when we went down to yeah. the, down to the stadium there. We, I thought it was a great idea, but in yeah. retrospect, when it was a 70-minute game, and um, you know, they didn't really care about us. So yeah, yeah, it was, that was. I mean, you'd never say no to that opportunity. Yeah. Playing the curtain raiser before the Lions New South Wales game, but yeah, in hindsight, it would have been great to play them out there. I don't think they would have got us, but you know, we were. Changed at the cricket ground there, which is a good 20 minute walk. We stood for 10 minutes in the tunnel before we were allowed to run onto the field, and then it yeah, 70 minutes, which doesn't suit us. We sort of come in slow and starting up. Yeah, yeah we, we are, for oh, whatever reason. We went at one game this year. I think we only led once this year from the beginning. We yeah. were doing a leg up. Yeah, we do. We do. And um, that's part of our makeup. It lets us come home strong. And, you know, so, but yeah, that, that game in particular, and then, yeah, we, we lost Coxie for a five or six week period through the middle there. I mean, he, he never gets injured. You know? he's sort of had to be without our leader, had a pretty big impact on the boys. Uh, Dan Yakapo lost him for the season early on with a broken thumb, Evan Olmstead, yeah. separated the bones in his legs. It was, oh. yeah, it was, it was horrific. And, um, well, we did well, you know. We still we still had our wins. We had our moments, and um, I think mean, also the the other clubs prepared a lot better to play against us this year. They they did their homework a lot stronger than they had done previously. We were a far bigger threat. Yeah, I knew in two thousand and ten that they did they all were doing the howlers because they didn't want to be beat by the person who's come a last. You know, yeah, they won a game. I mean, that was a little bit this with Penrith this year. I felt yeah. sorry for them, but yeah, they got to they you know, count this because they, they wanted to have the game more than we did. Yeah. Um, yeah, that last game in particular against Penrith, you know, we'd fallen out of the finals race the week before, losing to Warringah. But um, that was probably a pleasing aspect that showed the spirit that's still in the club and still in the first grade side because, you know, the attitude through the week was really positive and they, they trained hard and they actually played pretty well in that game in, in difficult circumstances. The easy yeah. thing to do would have been not to worry about it. In which case, Penrith will leave with us. Where, where to in the future for you and things like that? We've got uh, this year's gone now. Will most of the players stay, you think, you know, to change over from you to Gerard? Uh, you think we'll be in good shape for 2014? Yeah, I do. I think we're in really good shape. Actually, we've done um, one on ones with all the boys and got them in and had a chat, and losses are very minimal. Um, the boys have certainly learned a whole lot this year in terms of putting yourself into that sort of top level of the shoot shield week in, week out. So, um, yeah, lessons have been learnt and and maintaining most of the player base. I think um, boys will roll on really, really well. So you, you don't think we'll lose them because you, you, you know, a lot of them play for you. I mean, yep. I think, I think there, there may be a little bit of that, I don't think. Too much. Jared's been here for three years, and he's got certainly a healthy relationship with the boys, and he's got their respect. And um, I think it's time we had a little bit of turnover. Anyway, freshen things up. It's time for some of the young guys to really show themselves at the, at the first grade level, and we've certainly so. got the guys capable of doing that. I uh, mean, just about uh, there's probably two questions I want to ask you, like yeah, you know, your future coaching aspirations. Where you going to take a little bit of sabbatical? And, and the second one is uh, being a Kiwi, what can Australia do? <laughs> well, first, I mean, <laughs> my future <laughs> coach, Paramount, you can coach Australia. Yeah, well, it's exactly <laughs> similar challenges. Um, in terms of myself, you know, this is the first time since I've been married, really, or since I've even known my wife, pretty much, that we're, we're living somewhere that's not dictated by rugby. We've chosen the spot we want to live, and, you know, we brought property there, so coaching isn't isn't part of that plan. Um, I'll coach, again, without a doubt, still have aspirations. And, you know, it's my life and I'll continue to do it, but uh, I'm not sure if I want to jump straight back in there or have a rest for a while. I'm just going to move back there, relax for a while. I might, might get a real job. <laughs> Who knows? We'll, we'll see what happens there. So, um, 
yeah, coaching hasn't come into the equation. It's just all about family and living where we want to live. And so, yeah, I really don't know where it'll take me. It'll take me somewhere. Um, the Wallabies, mate, oh, honestly, sorry, Tapu, they, they just have to harden up, mate. You know, it's, they are absolutely got a soft underbelly for them. Um, they haven't even been competitive the games against New Zealand or South Africa or the last one against the Lions for that matter. Um, I think it all stems back to the system. Uh, coming through the schools, they've got the, they've got the pathway wrong and it's only a certain sort of player that progresses through that pathway and they're missing, missing all the other guys that are yeah. part of that private school pathway and um, you know, it's it's, yeah, it's resulting in the wrong guys coming through the system. Um, some of them are great and fantastic, and they'll always have those. And, but they need some, some harder blokes in there. For the under 20 side to be finishing eighth for the last couple of years at the World Champs is, is not good enough. And, yeah, it's, it's all coming home to roost, I think. Um, in New Zealand, every first 15 starts a year at school with a chance of being the top first 15 in the country. And they just, there's no way to even find that in the Australian system. So they've got to pull their fingers out of their bottles and everyone start pulling together for the one cause. I don't know. Apart from that, it's all good, mate. <laughs> well, again, I, I thank you on behalf of the club again for all the work you've done to bring us out of that. I, I didn't think really we, we could ever do it. I mean, in, in, in 2010, and then, like, even in 2009, it was just, uh, you know, put them on the paddock and things like that, and you, you develop that strength and that culture. Well, just hopefully it will, it will continue on. So we do we do thank you. Thank you. Glenn, I wish you all the best in New Zealand and whatever you do. Hopefully you don't see you back here coaching against us, but... <laughs> that'll, that'll never happen. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> we do we do appreciate all the work you've done with the club and uh, that to take us forward. And I know through Maryland's RSL, which has been a great, great sponsor. Uh, yeah, we do thank you and we thank them also. Thank you. It's been an absolute privilege being here. Yeah, I'm just thankful to be part of that journey. You know, it wasn't certainly wasn't my doing alone, so... Oh, it's been great not, but uh, certainly put a shine on the kids, so kids on the boys, I could say. Yeah, yeah, that's been absolute privilege.